All right, guys, welcome back to the second half of Section 2, and uh, we are being joined by, oh, Professor Jürgen von Braun, uh, who is a, a black lab slash German short-haired pointer mix and has decided to join us for a guest lecture for the uh, second part of uh, Section 2. So can you say hi, Jürgen? Can you say hi? Oh, oh thank you. Oh, I appreciate it. Um, okay, so uh, in this uh, part of Section 2, we're going to talk about um, measurement and reporting errors, i.e., um, uh, just because the numbers say one thing doesn't mean that's an accurate reflection of reality, right? So the most famous uh, uh, recording error uh, is what's affectionately known in criminal justice circles as the dark figure of crime. And the dark figure of crime just refers to was your crime actually reported to police or not? So there, there's lots and lots of crime every day that happens but never actually gets reported to police for many different reasons, okay? Um, and, and it's different based on different crimes. So homicide gets, you know, a much higher percentage of homicides get reported to police than, say, assaults or auto thefts or, um, uh, you know, more minor crimes, uh, uh, in general, tend to get reported even less than more major crimes, right? So when we're talking about underreporting, first thing we got to realize is the victim has to realize they're a victim, right? Um, especially with cybercrime, this can be a very big deal. Uh, not all cybercrimes result in somebody's bank account getting cleaned out, right? Um, you could be a victim of cybercrime... Uh, 10 times a day and never know it. Uh, if your computer has a zombie bot on it or something, like you, you might never figure that out and thus never even know you're a victim. And thus, of course, you're not going to report it to police, right? Uh, second issue was you have to see some kind of benefit in reporting. Uh, uh, you know, if, if my somebody breaks into my backyard and steals a couple of pink lawn flamingos, uh, I'm not going to report that to, poli to the police because, yes, I realize it was a crime. Yes, they stole something from me. But it's not worth the time of the local police department to try to find my $15 worth of kitschy plastic from the 80s. Um, so I'm not going to see any benefit in reporting that theft that technically happened and should be in the official statistics to the police because there's nothing they can do about it almost undoubtedly and it's not worth wasting their time to try. Um, and then finally... If you report it to the police, it has to get recorded properly. You know, in my case of the pink lawn flamingos, the police might say, well, do you have any evidence of who did it? Uh, do you have any cameras in your backyard? Do you, is there anything that they might have left fingerprints on? And if there's really nothing to go on, they might just choose not to record it as a theft at all. Um, or uh, let's say I own a business and I report an embezzlement, but and the police recorded it as an embezzlement, but really I'm trying to commit tax fraud and they just didn't figure that out. Or, you know, same thing with arson, house burns down and they report it as, uh, uh, you know, a natural fire, but in reality it was an arson, right? So there's a big giant list of reasons, and this is just a few of them, why a crime that actually happens in the real world might not actually make it into uh, 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 the... the official records, the official statistics. Now, another big problem is the criminal justice system workload. How many police officers do you have? How many resources do they have? Are they able to go on patrol? Are they able to respond to calls for service? Oh, thank you, Jurgen. I really needed 70 pounds of you on my lap. Um, same thing with courts and corrections, right? If we have very, very few probation and parole officers, very few people are going to get probation and parole, meaning people are going to, more people are going to be in prison and they're going to be there for a longer time. Oh, yeah. Oh, I know. It's upsetting, isn't it, buddy? Um, but different stages of the criminal justice process, the amount of uh, both personnel and resources that each stage has is can really affect how much crime is measured and when crime is measured how much you know how long is the average prison stay 
Uh, how many people get sentenced to rehab or alternative punishment versus prison? Uh, all those questions, just looking at the numbers might not tell you the whole story. Uh, uh, you know, an area that has much more arrests might not necessarily have more crime. Maybe they just have more police officers available to make arrests. So that workload, if one area has a lot of something and one area doesn't, the fact that they have a difference in any of these criminal justice measures, arrests, sentenced uh, people, you know, all those things, doesn't necessarily mean they have more or less of that. It's just they have more or less of uh, uh, their uh, resources. So what you're really trying to think about is are you comparing apples to oranges, right? And two different systems might have two vastly different ways of creating some given number or some given situation um, that might, and if you only look at the numbers, that might give you a vastly different idea of uh, 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 what's actually going on. So a uh, good example is conviction rates. In the adversarial system, there are some countries, not the United States, but there are some countries where if you just plead guilty and say, hey, I did it, you caught me, there's evidence, I'm throwing myself at the mercy of the court, you don't go to trial, and thus that's not counted as a conviction at trial. In other words, if you go to trial and you are protesting your innocence. You're saying, I'm innocent, I didn't do this, please find me not guilty, here, I've got this evidence. So you can get conviction rates at trial that are pretty low because a lot of people get found not guilty. Because you've taken all those people who are just admitting their, their guilt out of the equation. Whereas in many inquisitorial systems, or in fact, one of the kind of features of the inquisitorial system as a whole, is the fact that everybody goes to trial but basically, no, very few cases make it to trial unless it's very, very, very clear there's going to be a guilty verdict. <laughs> so all the people who have kind of, eh, that maybe, but maybe not, those cases get filtered out uh, 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 long before an actual trial. And all the people who just say, yeah, I'm guilty, uh, uh, get counted as a conviction at trial. So because of this situation, if you compare the conviction rates between a country with an adversarial system that doesn't count people who plead guilty as having gone to trial and the inquisitorial system where basically everybody goes to trial and trials don't happen unless it's pretty freaking clear you're going to get a conviction, the inquisitorial systems have way higher conviction rates. But it's not because they're not giving people a good defense. It's not because, uh, 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 you know, they're more people are guilty. It's not because of any of that stuff. It's because the system kind of gets people out of the trial pipeline in different ways and at different stages of the process. And it's not that inquisitorial systems have higher conviction rates as we would think of it. It's that they're only, you know, the, the way they get the numbers they put into that data set is very different from the way that ad, oh, other countries, especially in the adversarial system, get numbers into that data set. So you can't compare conviction rates between an inquisitorial system and an adversarial system and expect it to mean uh, anything vastly different about the quality or or uh, efficiency of their criminal justice system. It might mean a difference in that, but it might just be the fact that the systems are designed to kind of produce different outcomes in that way. All right, finally, we need to talk about globalization, right? As I mentioned a little bit in section one, our world is more and more and more interconnected, both because of plane flight and the internet and uh, uh, the ease of, of crossing many international borders, like in the European Union. Um, we live in a world that is very compressed in both space and time. It used to be if you wanted to run from the police in the United States, 
it would take you hours or days or even weeks to make it to the border of Mexico or the border of Canada. Now, I don't care where I am in the United States, I can be out of the country in a couple hours, right? Just fly to the nearest airport and, you know, fly to wherever you want. So this has greatly changed how we look at crime and criminals and the world uh, and criminal justice. So one of the things that I want to point out is that police officer uniforms in Nigeria look very similar to police officer uniforms in the United States. And that's not an accident. There is a reason, you know, people all over the world get inundated with American media, right? There's also, you know, obviously there's media coming from other countries too, but a huge chunk of it, especially in the late 20th century, was from the United States. And it showed American police officers. And people all over the world, everywhere from Texas to Timbuktu, got it in their heads through that media that, oh, that's what police are supposed to look like. And thus, police in their countries, when they're saying, hey, we need new uniforms, let's design them like this, they design them very similar to the United States. Because what we see and what we hear and what we read and what we, you know, kind of uh, 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 ingest from media and culture and society <laughs> affects what we think things are supposed to look like, how they're supposed to be. So if the American police uniform is what police are supposed to look like, then other countries are going to say, hey, we're going to design our police look uniforms that just happen to look very much like the American police uniforms because subconsciously, that's what we think police are supposed to look like. Globalization can also have uh, uh, lots of negative effects. So there's lots of great things that happen with globalization. Um, you know, I get to fly to Paris for my honeymoon, which I actually did, and it was amazing. Love that. Would not have been able to do that, uh, uh, you know, 200, 300 years ago. But there are a lot of bad things that come along with globalization. And one of those things is that crime and wealth and uh, lots of other things are being, um, in some cases, they're being distributed uh, uh, from uh, kind of areas in which they've been concentrated to others. And in other cases, they're being kind of concentrated, you know, so, so there's like a diffusion process and there's a con condensation process. And if essentially a lot of what's happening with a lot of uh, uh, social problems is that the rich countries, the United States, Western Europe, Japan, uh, uh, you know, places like that, crime and of certain types is getting less and less and less because it's moving to the third world. It's moving to uh, uh, you know, East Africa, it's moving to uh, South America, it's moving to the poor countries, the ones that, uh, you know, uh, have been traditionally exploited by those same uh, uh, groups. And in other cases, the wealth is flowing in the other direction, right? So mineral wealth and uh, uh, resources and cash and all those things go from poor areas to rich areas. So we're seeing this, this worldwide kind of stratification where there's rich areas and there's poor areas. And the rich are out sending their crime to the poor areas and the poor areas are sending their money and resources to the rich areas. Um, it's not a perfect system, obviously. Uh, there are lots of times where uh, the poor areas get lots of benefits from globalization. And there are lots of times where the rich areas gets negatives from this globalization process. But the overall sense, the overall kind of trend uh, is one of stratifying the world's population. The poor are either staying poor or getting even poorer. The rich are getting richer. And the difference between the two is growing rather than shrinking in a lot of uh, ways. This is kind of dangerous from a comparative criminal justice standpoint because you know there's kind of what's going to get called methodological nationalism 
okay? And that's the, the tendency to see countries as units or regions as units, like the continent of Africa. We're going to see that as one unit. And of course, we really know that there are dozens of different countries in Africa. But even less than that, there's lots of different divisions and cultures and peoples even within any given country, right? Um, like the United States. It's very difficult to look at the United States from a comparative perspective as one nation because our states are so vastly different when it comes to dang near every criminal justice issue, right? Everything from uh, policing to the death penalty to drug problems to uh, 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 court funding to, uh, you know, all, all these different things are so wildly different state to state to state to state that looking at the United States as one country for any of those issues is going to give you a really skewed view of what's actually going on. As such, we kind of need to start thinking of countries not as these monolithic units, but as, as areas that have very different peoples and societies and laws in a lot of cases and processes and and you know, kind of stop looking at the continent of Africa or Western Europe or the United States or South America, whatever. Stop looking at them as these monoliths that are the same, right? So I know I've kind of said this a lot uh, over the course of the first two sections, but one of the big lessons of this entire course is that uh, uh, putting any diverse group into categories has its use, has its uses, but it's very, very dangerous, and you don't want to go too far with it. Anyway, I'm going to end section two right there. Thank you so much for watching.